church history and Baptist history and the history of the young America. A young America. Now, when we, after the American Revolution, we didn't have freedom of religion or freedom of speech yet. That took an amendment to the Constitution. And the uh, Baptists stood hard for that amendment also. Now, let's go on here and read a little bit further. The mercenaries sent over from Germany by Great Britain to fight the Americans were the soldiers of the Roman Catholic Prince Frederick II. Landgrave of Hesse-Cassel, this prince, says Lowell, was a Catholic ruler of the Protestant country. He was a Catholic ruler of a Protestant country. His first wife had been an English princess, the daughter of George II. She had separated herself from the Landgrave on his conversion to Catholicism and returned to Hanau with her precious son. This is, one, this is history now, boy, this really comes up in history. The boy goes back later. Frederick had led a merry life at Cassell. He had taken to himself, cast off mistress of uh, Du de Bouillon, but he set up no pretensions in, to fidelity, and he said he had no more than 100 children. A French theater with a corps, de ballet, was maintained. French adventurers with good letters obtained a welcome and even responsible positions of state. The Roman Catholics in Ireland were mustered into the service as soldiers of the United Kingdom. The methods used by the priests and others to induce them to enlist in the army were very interesting. At first, many of the Irish Catholics in America enlisted in the colonial army. But under the pressure of the priesthood, many of them deserted and went over to the enemy. Well, when you say, We're, you're going to go to hell if you don't do this, you know, I mean, that really scares people, doesn't it? In reply to Dr. Shea, a Roman Catholic author, author which I have over there someplace, he was real famous, he said the Catholics uh, uh, enthusiastically joined in America with the revolution. He is lying through his teeth. They did not. The Catholic priest and, and Pope demanded that they join the other side because the, the, the king was, a, was ordained by God. Freedom and republics and democracies were not ordained by God, he said. Every sentence in Shea's letters, we know how Catholics had fared at the hands of their fellow colonists and remember the deep anti-Catholic hostility to the Papist in the early days of the revolution as we will find the next researchers fully set forth as we regard to the credit of the Catholics who were Tories rather than ignominy. Think of how they were reviled even in Pennsylvania where alone their rights were recognized by law and think of possible that all would ally themselves with the haters of their faith. Just as probable that Catholics in our day would do so with the church burners in 1844 or the know-nothings of a later period of time that's political know-nothings. Then apart from the religious aspect, but viewing the contest politically, why should Catholics have been at all on our side? Could none have honestly thought the demands of the colonists unfounded in, in law and justice? Could none have honestly destined to be approvers of the many outrages which were committed and which were sought to be excused because much must be pardoned in the spirit of liberty and were no Catholic subject to the British official or personnel influence or moved to no self-interest to take the side of Britain. It is in such a glory to have been a Whig that it is to an eternal infamy to have been a loyalist. Then the Catholics of Canada who by the authority of the clergy were kept loyal must now merit the exaggeration 
that their obedience as they suffered by excommunication for assisting the Bostonians. They were excommunicated because of Boston Harbor, you know, the Boston Tea Party and all of that. Likewise, consideration must be taken in the attitude of the clergy of the established Church of England. The Church of England is over here and, and set up in many states as the state church, and now the Church of England is speaking against the colonists that's supporting them. Some of the people adhered to the mother country. But that number was not large. At the close of the Revolution, they were scarcely an Episcopal clergy remained in this country. The church was completely destroyed. At the beginning of the struggle, a large number of the clergy at once assumed a position on the side of England and against the liberty of the colonies. They brought the subject into their pulpits. They denounced the people as insurrectionists and traitors and bidden them what happened January 6th. This reminded <laughs> you of something? <laughs> as insurrectionist traitors and commanded them to abandon the rebellion and submit without resistance to their legitimate rulers. So offensive were the sermons of some of them that the citizen felt themselves insufferably outraged. <coughs> you, didn't, you, you weren't taught this in school, were you? No. What? You weren't taught this in school. Oh, no. On one occasion, at least, a clergyman, after a Sunday's vaporing in the pulpit, was seized by the congregation carried into a neighboring forest fastened to a tree, and there received 39 lashes vigorously administered. They took him out and whipped him. <clears throat> and another to avoid that the like fate carried his pistols into the pulpit. And laying them on the side of, the, of his prayer book, in the presence of the assembly, told the congregation that he should proceed with the service that England had a right to govern them. And that he would read all the prayers for the king and the royal family and the government. And that he would shoot any man who attempted to restrain him. He brought the Church of England into that pulpit. Not many of the clergy, however, were so intrepid. The fearful and the faint-hearted therefore fled with all practical haste. The attitude of the clergy of the Episcopal Church is well illustrated by the extract given below from a letter from New York by Reverend Charles Ingalls, director of the Trinity Church. The present rebellion is certainly one of the most causeless. There's no reason for this rebellion. Unprovoked, unnatural that every disgraced any country a rebellion with peculiarly aggravated circumstances of guilt and ingratitude. The Episcopal clergy admits this scene of turmoil and disorder went on a steady with their duty and in their sermons confined themselves to the doctrines of the gospel. We know that not to be true. This is written by the enemy. Without touching on politics, using their influence to ally our hearts and cherish a spirit of loyalty among their people, this conduct, however harmless, gave great offense to our flaming patriots who laid it down as a maxim that those who were not for them were against them. Thus matters continued. The clergy proceeded regularly in their discharge of their duty where the hands of violence did not interfere until the beginning of the last of July when Congress thought proper to make a explicit declaration of independency by which all connection with the Great Britain was to be broken off and that the Americans released from any allegiance to our gracious sovereign. The only course which they, the clergy, could espouse was to suspend the public exercises of their religion and function and shut up their churches. This was accordingly done. It was very remarkable that although the clergy of those provinces I have mentioned did not and indeed could not consult each other in the interesting occasion. They couldn't communicate in different places. But they all shut down the churches at the same time. Surrounded by the patriots were the Tories, opposed by foreign armies, yet 
They had friends in England. The American war was conceived in injustice and nurtured in folly, and that it exhibited the highest moral turpitude and depravity, that England had nothing but victories over men struggling in a holy cause of liberty and defeats which filled the land with mourning of the loss of dear and valued relatives slain in a detested and impious quarrel. Why? History repeats itself, doesn't it? <laughs> and when six months later in the same assembly, two days after the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown had been published in England, the eloquent Fox adopted the words of uh, Chatham and uttered at the beginning of the revolution said, Thank God that America has resisted the claims of the mother country. Religiously now, it is very expedient for him to change his mind. Burke and others in the same legislature spoke words of kindred import, full of peril to themselves, that expressed the sentiments of the descendants of England, and especially those of the Baptists. Now, I want you to see something. How many of you watched the movie Moby Dick, the old one? I can't see enough. Yeah, the old one with Gregory Peck. Anyway, he called for them there when they were going to go kill this white whale, this white devil. He called for them to, to give blood from their veins. They did this a lot back then. Give blood in a basin so they could dip the harpoon points in this blood. They were going to baptize them in blood. Now that came from someplace. That came from somewhere. Let's look and see where it came from. When Robert Hall, the future eloquent preacher, was a little boy, he heard John Ryland of Northampton, a man commanding his influence among the Baptists, say to his father, If I were Washington, I would have summoned all the American officers, and they would form a circle around about me, and I would dress them and would offer a libation in their own blood, in other words, give their own blood, And I would order one of them to bring a lancet. See, that's exactly what happened on Moby Dick. They didn't show this, but this is what was happening in the back scenes, according to the book. And a punch bowl, and we would bear our arms and be bled. And when the bowl was full, when we all had been bled, I would call on every man to consecrate himself to the work of dipping his sword in the bowl and entering into solemn and covenant engagement by oath, one to another, that we would swear by him that sits upon the throne and live forever and ever, that we would never sheath our swords while there was an English soldier in arms in America. These were Baptists. <clears throat> Now, I believe that all our Baptist ministers in town, except two, most of our brethren in the country were on the side of the Americans in the late dispute. We wept when the thirsty plain drank the blood of our departed heroes. The shout of the king among us and our well-fought battles were crowned with victory. And to the hour we believe that the independence of America will for a while secure the liberty of, the, of this country, but if the continent had been reduced to Britain, would have not been long been free. The great was the peril of uncertainty, the actions of foreign-born persons, that the generals in the army could only trust native-born citizens. England was buying mercenaries from Germany and Ireland or wherever they could get them. But now, American soldiers, American generals, did not trust anybody in their ranks except natural born people that had been born in America. General Gates issued the following orders from headquarters in Cambridge, July the 7th, 1775. The general has great reason and high they displeased with the negligence and the intention of those officers who are placed as sentries 
at the outpost men whose characters are not acquainted. He therefore orders that the future no man shall be appointed to those important positions and station who are not native to this country and has a wife or family in it who, to who he is known to be attached. He had to be a native born because then you, you beloved your country. This last generation has been taught to hate America. And look at it. Look what's happened. The last generation in America has been taught to hate America. And this woke system that, that's in, adhering to this, what we might call administration, is teaching people that America is a wicked, wicked, wicked nation. And yet, why is all everybody wanting to come to America if it's so wicked? Well, here's where it all started now. This order is to be understood as a standing one, and the officers are to give obedience to it at their own peril. If they don't do this, they're going to be in danger. The next day the general gave orders for the enlistment of men as follows. You are not to enlist any person who is not an American born. Unless such a person has a wife and family or is settled as a resident of this country. After the great conspiracy in the life of Washington, the life of the guard was re reorganized on April 30th, 1777. General Washington was then at, that, at Morristown, New Jersey. He sent to the commanders the following confidential letter. Sir, every person up there in Washington, D.C. ought to swear allegiance to America. If they won't swear allegiance to America, they shouldn't be there. If they won't put their hand on an American Bible and swear allegiance under God to this country, they shouldn't be there. Sir, I want to form a company for my guard. In doing so, I wish to be extremely cautious because it is no more than probable that in the course of my campaign, my baggage, my, bar, my uh, baggage, my papers, and other matters, of great public import may be committed to the sole care of these men. These are the marching orders. These are the battle plans. This being promised, in order to impress you with the proper intention and the choice, I have to request that you will be immediately furnished me with our four men of your regiment, and as it, in my further wish that this company should look well, be nearly a size that I desire that none of the men shall exceed more than five foot ten inches, nor fall short, fall short of five foot nine inches, that possess the pride and appearing neatness of a soldier, and I'm satisfied that there can be no absolute security of the fidelity of this class of people, but yet I think it most likely to be found in those who have family connections with this country. You will therefore send to me none but natives, American-born. This is George Washington. Did you ever read this in church? Did you ever read church history to you? No, they didn't do it. No way. We need to teach this in all of our postulates, and every man in America running for office ought to adhere to these principles. There was a reason why an American president was supposed to be native-born, wasn't it? There's a reason for it. Yeah. I must insist in making the choice that you will give no intimidation of my preferences for natives, as I do not want to create any invidious distinction between them and the foreigners. December the 14th, 1896. These statements give a good insight into the perils which surround the Americans in the period of the Revolutionary War. They were surrounded with enemies from within and without the fifth column from within, and now what's happened to us today? The enemies are our lawmakers. Something's wrong. The most careful watchfulness was demanded. The reason why I'm teaching this is so you won't repeat history again. We had to go through this once, you know. Only patriots should be trusted. And true men with a American spirit and liberty were imperatively demanded 
The Baptists were such men. The Baptists wanted a country where there was freedom, but freedom of religion especially. And it hadn't been won even when we warned the American Revolution. It had to be fought in the Constitution. They were accustomed to a hardy life, had long been trained in the rugged school of experience, were loyal and trusted citizens, and above all, were endued with a spirit of wisdom and liberty. No man, not a man of them, proved a traitor. They cast their united strength into the American cause. The Baptists were the first among the first of their religious bodies to recognize the authority of the Continental Congress. Warren Association, Association of New England recognized the Congress as the highest civil resort. A convention in the in the county of Suffolk at this time, the head of the Massachusetts gave continents to the Congress in these words, this county, confiding in wisdom and integrity of the Continental Congress, now sitting in Philadelphia, will pay all due respect and submission to such measures as may be recommended by them to the colonies for the restoration and establishment of our just rights, civil and religious. These resolves were carried by Bacchus to the Continental Congress and were as follows represented by the Warren Association. The Warren Association is a Baptist association, by the way. That's a Baptist association of churches. To the honorable delegates of the several colonies in North America met in the General Congress in Philadelphia. Honorable gentlemen, as the anti pedo Baptists and Anabaptist churches in, North, in, in New England and most heartily concerned with the preservation and the defense of our rights and privileges of this country are deeply affected by the encroachments of the same which have lately been made by the British Parliament and are willing to unite with our dear countrymen vigorously to pursue every prudent measure for relief as we may leave in that as a distinct denomination of Protestants we conceive that we have equal claim to charter rights with the rest of our fellow Baptists and subjects, and yet have been long denied the free and the full enjoyment of these rights as to the support of religious worship. They were not allowed to do this. The last one I told you where that 65-year-old man was carried off in prison for preaching the gospel. That's all. Therefore, we, the elders and brethren of the 20 Baptist churches, met in association at Medfield, 20 miles from Boston, September 14, 1744, have unanimously chosen and sent into you the Reverend and beloved Isaac Bacchus as our agent, <coughs> and to lay our cause in these respects before you, and otherwise to use all the prudent means he can for our relief. The grievances of the Philadelphia Association were likewise severe. The case of our brethren suffering under ecclesiastical oppression in New England being taken under consideration, it is, was agreed to recommend to our churches to contribute to the necessities agreeable to the pattern of the primitive churches who contributed to the relief of the distressed brethren in Judea and that the money raised for them remitted to Mr. Bacchus in conjunction with the committee and advice in the colony distributed to the brethren. The case of our brethren above considered induced to appoint a committee of grievances who may from time to time receive accounts of the sufferings and difficulties of our friends and brethren in the neighborhood of the colonies and meet as often as we shall appear needful to the city of Philadelphia to consult upon the persecute and prosecute such measures to their relief as they shall judge most expedient and may correspond with the Baptist committees in the Massachusetts Bay and elsewhere. On the committee, among others, were appointed with the Reverend Samuel Jones, who cooperated with Bacchus to presenting the Baptist petition to the Continental Congress. Now, the Continental Congress, the Baptists were very important because these were the, they were given money, 
They were giving their lives. They were giving their estates for the American Revolution. These people were putting it all on the line, just like those that signed the, the, the preamble to the Constitution, John Hancock, etc. They all put their whole lives and their families' lives on the line. <clears throat> Resolved that the establishment of civil religious liberty to each denomination in the province. They're asking for all religious liberty in every con in every in every colony that they will have religious liberty that they won't have to pay taxes to a preacher they don't support. On reading the memorial of Reverend Eisenbach, this agent of the Baptist churches and this government, resolved that the establishment of civil and religious liberty to each denomination in the province is a sincere wish of this Congress. But being by no means vested with the powers of civil government whereby they can redress the grievances of any person whatsoever, that they have recommended to the Baptist churches when the General Assembly shall be convened to the colony, they lay the real grievances and sad churches before the same and when, when and where their petition will most certainly meet with all the attention due to the memorial of denominations of Christians so well disposed to the public will of this country. John Hancock, President. There's an extract from the minutes by Benjamin Lincoln, Secretary. The first colony to take official stand against Great Britain was Rhode Island. Guess what's in Rhode Island? That's the first religiously free colony in America. Mm -hmm. It was a Baptist colony, basically, but you could, you could believe anything. You didn't get taxed and, and didn't support any Baptist church. This, it was 22 days before the Virginia acted, however reluctant other portions of the continent may have been to certain ideal to a final separation from the mother country in this co colony. The desire for absolute independence was already early conceived and steadily followed. The democratic character of Rhode Island enabled the legislature, it was a democracy, remember, this is a Baptist a free colony. It was a democracy. Represent fairly and fully the will of the people, and their will was at all hazards to preserve that charter, albeit at the expense of the former loyalty. They had a charter really allowing them to have religious freedom there, but they would lay that down and everything. They already had a religiously free colony. If they joined the rebellion or the the colonies in rebellion against it. Great Britain, they would lose that charter. But they thought it more expedient to stand with the colonists than with the charter they had. The Baptists have and always have been, said Morgan Williams, more numerous than any other sect of Christians in the Rhode Island. Two-fifths of the inhabitants, at least, are reputed Baptists. The governors, deputy governors, judges, assemblymen, and officers, and civil and military are all of that persuasion. The first work of Rhode Islanders after the incorporation in 1640 was to make a law that every man should submit peaceably to civil government in this colony shall worship God according to his own dictates and of his own conscience without molestation. The date of the withdrawal of the colony from Great Britain was May the 4th, 1776. This is before July the 4th, okay? Two months before the adoption of the Declaration of Independence. The following recital of the misdeeds of George III is included in this act. Whereas in all the states existing by compact protection and allegiance are reciprocal, the latter being only due to consequence of the former, Whereas George, the third king of Great Britain, forgetting his dignity regardless of the compact most 
solemnly entered into, ratified, and confirmed to the inhabitants of this colony by his illustrious ancestors up until late, fully recognized him and entirely departing from the duties of the charter of a good king. Instead of protecting, is endeavoring to destroy the good people in this colony. And of the United Colonies, by sending fleets and armies into America to confiscate our property and to spread fire, sword, and desolation throughout our country in order to compel us to submit to the most debasing and detestable tyranny whereby we are obliged by necessity, it becomes our highest duty to use every means which God and nature has furnished us to support our invaluable rights and privileges to oppose that power which is exerted only for our destruction. The people were tremendously in earnest. They immediately removed the artillery from the royal fort to be used by the colonists. When the Declaration of Independence was announced, they were enthusiastic with shouts of liberty over the globe. The Rhode Islanders were of such ardent patriots, size far, that after the capture of the island by Sir Peter Parker, it required a great body of men to be kept there in perfect idleness for three years to retain them in subjection. The Baptists were willing to give their lives. They, they put everything on the line. <clears throat> The Baptist South Carolina, like it like, took a noble stand. Richard Furnham, a young man, was pastor in Charlton. He was an ardent advocate of the rebellion. Everywhere, on stumps and in barns, as well as in pulpits, he preached resistance to Britain, pursued by the Tories, and a young Furman fled to the American camp. And there, by his prayers and eloquent appeals, so reassured the patriots that Cornwallis is said to have remarked that he feared the prayers of this godly youth more than the armies of Sumter and Marion. He feared his prayers more than the armies. <laughs> the colonists did not decide on a final resistance to England until 1776. The Baptists in 1775 anticipated an action by a year. In a memorial in the House of Burgess, soldiers were promised the overthrow of the established suggestion that the parity of all ministers be requested. To the Honorable Peyton Randolph, Rodolph, Randolph Esquire, the several delegates and gentlemen convened in Richmond to concert measures conductive to the good and well-being of the colony and the dominion, the humble address of the Virginia Baptist now associated in Cumberland by delegates from the several churches, the Cumberland Association. Gentlemen, at the convention, while you are in pursuit of important trust, repose in you, and acting to the guardians of the rights of your constituents, and pointing out them to be read, and freedom must needs afford you exalted satisfaction to find your determinations and only applauded but cheerfully complied with by a brave and spirited people. We however distinguished from the body of the countrymen by accolades and sentiments of a religious nature. Do nevertheless look upon ourselves as members of the same commonwealth and therefore with respect to the matters of civil nature embarked in this same common cause. Alarmed by the shocking oppression which in a British cloud hangs over American colonies, we as a society and part of the distressed state have in our association consisted what part might be most prudent for the Baptists to act in the present unhappy contest. After we had determined that in the same cause it was lawful to go to war and we also for us to make the military resistance against Great Britain in regard to their unjust invasion, tyrannical oppression, and repeated hostilities toward America. Our people were all left to act in discretion 
with respect to enlisting without fa failing under the censure of the community, as some have enlisted and many were likely to do so and will have earnest desires for their ministers to preach to them during the campaign. We therefore delegate and appoint our well-beloved brethren, Minister Elijah Craig, Jeremiah Walker, John Williams, to present this address and to the petition that you may have free liberty to preach to the troops at convenient times without molestation or abuse. And we are conscious of their strong attachment to the American liberty, as well as their soundness in the principles of this Christian religion, and great usefulness in the work of the ministry, as we are willing that they may come under your examination as ministers you may trust. We conclude that our earnest prayers to Almighty God for His divine blessing on your patriots' laudable resolves for the good of mankind and American freedom and for the success of our armies in defense of our lives, liberties, and properties, etc. The 14th of August in 1775, a whole year before. Now it goes on how that the Baptist preachers went out there. John Gano, remember that name, John Gano. John Gano preached to George Washington. George Washington was converted and baptized while in the war. These men went in there and they fought alongside these generals and these men. They did more than was called upon them to do because they were fighting more than just liberty from Great Britain. They wanted to fight for liberty of religion for all mankind. Liberty of freedom of thought. I, I don't like Job Hobowitz's doctrine. I don't like the Roman Catholic doctrines. I don't like the Church of England doctrines. I don't like the Mormon doctrines. But I believe they ought to be able to preach these doctrines <clears throat> as freely as we do. And that's what Baptists died for. We never go with a sword and convert a Mormon or a Catholic or a Church of England. We never go with a sword to convert them. That's anti-God and anti-Bible. But we have fought and we have proclaimed the Word of God in its purity to all of these groups. But we leave them to be through their own conscience because they will answer to God not to us. They will answer what we preach to them. It's once you heard the truth, you're reliable. You're liable for it. Our Father, I, we send this message out again that it might bring honor and glory to you and your Son and to your churches that have been down to the age and what these men stood for and fought for so we might have religious liberty today. Father, please help us hold on to it and remember that freedom costs a lot all the time. Freedom is hard to keep and freedom must be fought for every day. It's just one step away from tyranny. Father, please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name.